This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash knowhow and enter the promo code knowhow. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit the tracker.com right now and enter the promo code knowhow to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. Welcome to the world of tomorrow! Your questions are answers. Welcome to Know How. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be showing you some of the stuff that we've been geeking out to so you can take it home and geek out on your own. That's right. Hippo. Padre. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm looking forward to answer some of these questions that we've been putting off for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're still kind of clear in the backlog. This yeah. is all good. You know, it's going to take a while. You guys ask a lot of really, really good questions. You've got some great projects. We want to get them all in. Uh, but at, at this point, it's kind of like trying to watch all the YouTube video that's ever been uploaded. There's always more <laughs> that's being uploaded than we can ever see. We need the, like, uh, yeah. clockwork orange eyeball things to hold, hold our eyes open while we read all the questions. So what I would say is if you've got a question that you asked and you really want answered and we like didn't answer it for over a year you may want to bump it up in the google plus group or maybe tweet it to us or that or, or, email. or some questions are best left unanswered but not these questions no no not at all now, also email knowhow at twit.tv is a really good way to sort of bump it up for us uh, uh, three of the feedbacks that we've recently done have come off of that from from people saying Hey, I asked this like back in 2014, and I was kind of hoping you might have an answer. So if you got that, please bring it to our attention. Uh, so do you get those emails too? I the do. know-how ones? Both of us. Okay. So it's if I we have to have them. some system <laughs> where we know who's responded to them because I'm like, oh, Brian's got this. Ah. Sometimes I do, yeah. <laughs> but, but I see those emails and I'm like, I have a backlog where I save them. I'm like, I should ask Padre about these. Because most of them are like, <laughs> I, I have no clue. Yeah, no, well, no, I think what I'll do is I'll make sure that I'm always copying you and you always copy me. So we know, because we don't want to, yes. it would be horrible if we gave one person two different a piece of Answers. advice that went and in two different directions. <laughs> or, or the same advice. Like, uh, I already got that answer from Padre, and uh, his was better. <laughs> Whatever. All right, but let's go ahead and dove, dive straight in. We've got one from a, a fan favorite. He's actually been part of the uh, the Kitas for such a long time. It's Red Dog. Red Dog. And he asks, episode 208, Distance Networking, gave me an idea, but not sure it is a good one. Can Fiverr be pulled in an existing conduit run, and can it survive a pull of about 100 feet? The idea that Fiverr is not affected by quick changes in current is the number one reason for using. Okay. Uh, actually, very, very good. Remember, we did that project a while back where we were explaining how someone could do a long distance run with Fiverr. Right. How uh, technically he could have done it with copper. Mm -hmm. to, you know, the distance was enough because remember, copper can do up to. 300, uh, around 300, just over 300 meters, about okay. a thousand feet. But his worry was that there was going to be a lightning strike, and copper does conduct electricity. Right, and, and then fling it back into the house that, or something. That yeah. could be bad. And yeah. yes, you could use power conditioners where you basically ground the lightning before it gets to the really expensive equipment, mm -hmm. but you'd still lose the run. The, the solution that we came up with was to actually use direct berry fiber. That's the kind of fiber that's it's armored, so you don't even need to put it into a conduit. You can just right. put it straight into the ground. Because it's fiber, it's not conductive. The lightning isn't going to transmit through it. And it also meant that you could get longer, uh, longer distances and higher speeds over time. Right. What Rudd Dog wants to know is he, if he can use something like that, but in a less demanding environment. He's not running it between you know, a barn and a house that, that maxes out ca uh, copper. He's going to be inside an existing conduit. Now, right. this is a question I get all the time because, well, people want to know, is it a direct upgrade? Can I just tie a piece of a fiber 
to the end of my old copper and then pull the copper and, and pull the fiber through. Right, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, and for, for the most part, you're absolutely right. A fiber will work just like premise copper. It, mm -hmm. will, it will go through conduits, it's, it's rather small, and you can get a, you know, far more concentration of strands inside of fiber than you can inside of copper. There are a couple of things that you need to be aware of if you're gonna do this first. Uh, first of all, absolutely, Rudd Dog for your project, 100 feet, not a problem. Do it, do it, it's gonna be awesome, you're gonna love it, and you're gonna geek out. However, before you actually do it, you need to take a look at the conduit itself. This is tough because a lot of us don't actually know what the conduit looks like, especially if it was there before we got into the building. Right. Uh, but, you know, fiber has what's called a minimum bend radius. Mm -hmm. So think of it as here's my fiber. It will bend a certain amount before you shatter the glass inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is actually cumulative. So what you might be able to get away with to, and have the fiber running over time that band radius is actually going to put more and more stress on the glass until it actually shatters. Okay. Uh, that's, which is no bueno. Bad, bad, yeah. Which is bad. It so won't work. Know, yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's not like copper where if it works, you're like, okay, we must be good. It could yeah. be, it works, but it's going to fail in, in two years. I see, yeah. Uh, so look at the minimum bend radius. That's, that's what you want to do. Look at the conduit and look at the minimum bend radius and make sure that there's nothing that, like freaky. You're not going to have... A conduit that does like this little loop, like a loop. U joint or something. Yeah, don't do that. Don't okay. do that. Uh, most likely not. For a hundred foot, I'm betting there's not going to be anything crazy. But if you're running over a conduit that is really, really old, where they were running like old telephone cables, there could be a chance that that Cat Five was able to deal with it. Fiber may not be able to deal with it. Okay. My other question would be, if you're using an existing conduit and say there's like power lines running through that, yeah. um, that wouldn't affect fiber at all, right? Not at all. Yeah. Fiber, that's one of the reasons why we like fiber so much. In fact, that's why Rudd Dog is, is considering it. It's, it. There is no copper in it. There's yeah. nothing conductive. It's, it's optical. So I could pass it, I mean, as long as it's not melting because of the heat of <laughs> right. the power passing through the, the adjacent conductor, it's gonna be just fine. In fact, uh, that's one of the advantages of running fiber, which is I can run it right next to my power, and I'm not gonna worry about any stray RF messing up my signal. Okay, okay, okay cool. So, so yeah, do that. So first of all, check check your conduit, check your bed radius. The other thing is um, you're gonna want some specialized tools. Actually, if you go to this, uh, the first picture there, Alex, uh, this, is, uh, this is what a typical piece of fiber would look like. So I've got the outer jacket, I've got what's called the strength member. Every piece of fiber, especially premise fiber, has got this. Then you've got the coating, the cladding, and the core. The core is what people focus on, but that's not what you're gonna be pulling on. You're gonna be pulling on the strength member. You need a way to be able to pull on the strength member, not on the actual fiber, mm -hmm. and not on the outer jacket. Because if you're pulling on anything but the strength member, all you're doing is stretching the cable. Okay, so how do you just pull on the strength member? Uh, well, you're gonna want to use grips, and this we got another picture. This is what a grip looks like. Um, there's a lot ah. of different styles of grips, and uh, basically what it, what you do is you run the fiber through it, and then it kind of intermeshes with the grip. Yeah. It typically, like goes through a loop. The whole idea is it stretches out the force over a longer length of it fiber. It reminds me of uh, those, what are they, Chinese handcuffs? Yeah, exactly, that's, that's exactly what they are. Because what, you know, the, the, uh, the tendency is to think of it like copper. And what would you do with copper? You'd kind of like just grab it and bundle up and just yank. Yeah. Well, the problem is you're now exerting all that force. On a fine point. On that fine point and you will snap it. 100% oh. guarantee you will <laughs> snap it. What a grip will do is it allow you to sort of stretch that force over a really, really long length. Mm -hmm. And it also transfers that force directly to that strength material, the, the thing that's giving the fiber its, its rigidity, yeah. rather than just pulling on the outer cladding right. or the outer, the outer uh, wrap. I have seen people pull fiber and then they get to, like they go back to the box and they realize like the last 10 meters has no wrapper because they basically pulled the wrapper through. Ooh, <laughs> so, yeah, oh, yeah, that's bad. It's not, no, no, don't do that. So yeah, get yourself a grip. They're not that expensive. Uh, the other thing is only use fiber shears. People will think of, of fiber the same way that they think of copper, so they'll just take their diagonal cutters and, and cut it. Yeah. That, that doesn't just mess up the fiber here, mm -hmm. that could shatter the fiber down the line, like several meters. Because of the, just, you cut it and it 
it like sends the force down the line? Well, it's because it's the way that it's cutting. If you if you look at what a, what a diagonal cutter is actually doing, it's yeah. not really cutting as much as it's crushing. Now on uh, copper, yeah. it's fine because copper is malleable, so right. it will crush until it separates, right? But in fiber, it, it's going to shatter. So what a fiber shear is, fiber shears are actually incredibly sharp. They do not crush, they cut. Okay. Uh, now, if you do get yourself a nice pair of fiber shears, don't ever let anyone use it. Don't put it in your regular toolbox. <laughs> uh, you'll keep it in a special place because if someone takes your fiber shears and goes, wow, these are really strong, I can cut through anything, you're now dulling your fiber shears <laughs> and you're back to crushing. Uh, okay. And I say this from experience. So You've seen this from experience, I, I've, like cutting I have, stuff? I used to do interop, and I had my own pair of fiber shears, like mm -hmm. my pair. And people would come by my desk, oh, look, and they'd like cut paper with it. I'm like, no, yeah. no, no, stop <laughs> it. Well, okay, so so say you pull the fiber through the conduit all the way to the other side, yeah. and you, you're like, okay, I have all this leftover fiber. I use the shears to cut it down. And then attaching the cap to it, right? Is yeah. that difficult? Uh, yes. Because, I mean, there's special tools just to clean the yeah. tip. Uh, there's different types of fiber. Uh, Brian Chi, who's one of my co-hosts on This Week in Enterprise Tech, his favorite story is he was in the Las Vegas Convention Center for an interrupt. Mm -hmm. up summer, remember, this is summer, so super, super hot. And now imagine tin roof. So you're right under that tin roof, oh. and it's just baking. It's just, you're up on a catwalk. Yeah, boiling and people. he had to do what was called a hot melt which was, it was a very specialized <laughs> Sounds delicious. Product. Oh man, it's like toxic fumes, super oh, hot. He's feeling faint and he's like 100 feet off the ground. He's like, oh, I'm gonna die. Oh, jeez. Uh, the easiest to terminate is cable called Volition by 3M. I'm not even sure if they make it anywhere. It was awesome because they had a kit, mm -hmm. a self-contained kit that uh, had the fiber shear so you would cut it. Then they had strippers that would strip away the outer cladding so you would get just the fiber. Yeah. Then you need to clean clean off with acetone, the little coating they put around the, the actual glass fiber. Yeah. And then there's a you have to put it into the connector and then you polish it against a whetstone. Wow. Because remember, right, we to talked, smooth the, yeah. you gotta smooth it out. Because if it's not smooth, those little ripples in the end of the glass are actually gonna mess up your signal. So it's not the easiest thing. Uh, but when it is done right, oh, it feels so good. <laughs> so specialized okay. tools. Uh, the other thing is, um, once you do finish pulling through, you wanna, you're gonna discard the first about 10 feet. Okay. Uh, and that's because, just assume that that first 10 feet has probably been shattered. Okay. Um, it's, you know, it's better than cutting it too short and then having to rerun the entire thing. Right. And I always leave myself at least six foot of what's called service loop. So. Uh, past that 10 feet, I pull mm -hmm. another six feet, and that gets coiled up. And the reason why I want to leave that is uh, just terminating fiber is kind of a fine art. Yeah. And even the best, the best, the best of the best of the best of the people who terminate will find out every once in a while the terminations need to be redone. And so right. you might need to cut back. And that might happen several times. You always want to make sure you have some extra because that fiber is going to be there long term. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you have enough to keep doing that. Smart. Smart. Yeah. yeah, don't don't just measure out the exact length you need no. and then cut it and no, then no, realize no. that you made a mistake. Yeah, yeah that's that. that I've would done be, that uh, before. That Not with fiber, but with other things. Yeah, and I'll imagine doing it with fiber where it is a pain to terminate. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah, I've done that, I think, with Ethernet. Like, I, I pulled the cable through the ceiling into my room and then was like, oh, I don't need all this extra. I just need to go to the wall. And then not realizing that the other side needed a little bit more slack. <laughs> it's like, oh, like, oh no. We're going to have to rerun this. Rerun the yeah. entire thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, Rudd Dog, do it and give us pictures. Cool. Yeah. Let's go, uh, go to the next one. We actually have, this is an interesting one because it, uh, it was from a different show we have on the Twit TV network. Uh, Brian, what we got? Uh, we have other shows on this network? I, know, right? I thought it was just us. <laughs> So Justin asks, a few months ago on Screensavers, you showed us uh, the Save From Net tool that lets you download videos from YouTube and other online services. It worked great. I don't have to download an app or install anything on my computer. I just recently went back to the site, and now when I try to download, it tries to make me buy a downloader. Is there a similar service I can use for free? Justin, I feel your pain. I know exactly what you're lame. talking about. It is kind of lame. I mean. I can't fault them. They made a free tool. It got mm -hmm. really, really popular. I'm like, hey, man. I, I need to make some money. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, but I mean, that was the reason why I liked the download from for, in the first place, because yeah. I don't want to install anything on my computer. I, there's been so many instances of these YouTube Vimeo downloaders that always had, 
I'm going to be generous and say <laughs> it's bloatware, but I mean, that some is of it was straight up malware. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and I, what, what, what was the one that you used for the longest time when you were still on a Mac? <laughs> I, I mean, I think it was, I remember the icon. It was like a yellow, blue, and red ball, yeah. but I, I feel like it was called something dumb like YouTube Downloader. Yeah, I, I remember I tried three different ones on a Windows PC that I had hooked up to my uh, my network sniffer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure enough, like 30 seconds after downloading, I'm like, oh, look, it's phoning home. No. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's why I like Bad. this service. Uh, let me show you exactly what he's talking about. So, uh, if you go to my computer, Alex, this is, uh, this. oh, this is YouTube. Uh, so, oh, hi, let's, YouTube. let's take this one. I'm going to take this episode. All I need is the link. So, I'm going to take the link, and then I go there. This is uh, Save From Net. Uh, the way that it works, let me go ahead and zoom in here. The way that it works is you're supposed to put in the link to whatever you want, and it's not just YouTube. This works for many, many things. But then it gives you the option to download it. Unfortunately, and this is the reason why it's waiting so long, it goes, oh, no, no, we don't do this anymore. You have to download the app from us, and then you can get whatever content boo. you want. Boo. Boo. Boo on you. I mean, I get not it, really boo. But I get boo. it. But, yeah, boo. So he needs a way to do this, but without that annoying thing. Okay. And believe it or not, there's actually a way to do it from the same site. Alex, if you go back... Uh, here's something they probably don't want you to know, and I'm betting they're going to fix this at some point in the very <laughs> near future. They only have this nag screen on the English version. So if I go to Spanish... Espanol? Espanol. If I go to Spanish or any other language, this is the old interface, and now I can download. <laughs> so keep it on the download, everyone. <laughs> don't... <laughs> Keep this quiet for a little while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, now they know. Well, they're going to see that. You think they watch our show? <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, go figure. Let's let's see how long it takes for them to to roll out apps in all the different languages. Yeah. Uh, mm. And you know, again, I kind of feel for them because it is a really good product. It's it's yeah. a very easy to use service. I wish there was a way for me to like pay a little bit. Right, like a donate kind like of thing. Like a donate type thing, but yeah. no, don't make me download an app, folks. That's <laughs> there was a site, too, that I used a lot like that, um, but what you could do instead is in, at the top in the URL, it would say to equal false. And if you change that to true, <laughs> you could then download it. <laughs> that, like, that's fun. Yeah, it's, you know, there's always a little thing where you start poking around the interface going, I'm, you know, I'm betting yeah. the old product is in here somewhere. And true enough, for this it is. It's mm -hmm. just you need to speak Espanol or <laughs> French or German. Right. They, they have like Nine. 12 different languages in there. So. <laughs> so it might take them a little while to update that. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just actually, I, like I wonder if you could use Google Translate. Just I don't undo, undo the, the mix. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Hey, Brian, you know what I like? What's that? Power. Power? Power. What kind we of power? always need more power. Uh, how about alternative power? Yeah. Alternative yeah. power is cool. We do have a uh, Akita out there mm -hmm. who needed a little bit of help. She uh, she's looking at a way to to take her little rural environment and get it off the grid. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. we're gonna survive the zombie apocalypse. Survive. Kind of thing. We're, we're gonna help her survive the zombie apocalypse. But first, these messages. Of course, a lot of us put a lot of thought into our tech. It's the stuff that we use to communicate. The stuff that we used to stay connected. But what if I told you that there's a piece of technology in your home that you spend nearly a third of your day on and you don't think about it as much as your last tablet or laptop? Well, folks, there is a piece of tech and it's called your bed. Now, we know that you have to get the right amount of sleep. If you don't, you don't think right, you don't act right, you're just not the person you want to be. Well, why do that? Why waste a third of your life? Why not take that third of your life and turn it into something that's relaxing, something that's luxurious and something that's incredibly tech-driven. That's exactly what you get with Casper. A Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost of what you might see in a showroom. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and those showrooms and passing the savings directly to you, the consumers. Now, Casper's mattresses aren't just fluffy pieces of cloth and filling. They're actually technological wonders. Casper is made of a supportive memory foam for a sleep surface with just the right amount of sink and just the right amount of bounce. Plus, it's got a breathable design that helps it to sleep cool to let you regulate your temperature throughout the night. Especially as we start to move into the summer, this becomes important. What good is a soft mattress, a comfy mattress, if you wake up in the middle of the night drenched in sweat because it's retained all of your body heat? A Casper mattress provides long-lasting comfort and support, and you can buy it easily online and completely risk-free. 
Oh, we got a new Casper mattress here for Leo, and, well, he just loves it. It's so soft. It's so comfortable. And Casper understands the importance of truly trying out a mattress that, in all reality, you spend a third of your life on. That means that they don't have it in a showroom where you can drop yourself on top of it for 30 seconds or a minute. Instead, they'll deliver it to your home, and you get to try it out for a 100-day period. If, after that 100-day period, you decide that it's not for you, you just ship it back. How's that? For a guarantee. And did you know statistically lying on a bed in a showroom has no correlation to whether or not it's the right bed for you, the right bed for your space, the right bed for your house? If you want to get a better night's sleep, if you want to put the same sort of detail into your sleep technology that you put into your phone, then you owe it to yourself to try Casper. Casper mattresses uphold the highest environmental protection standards and are made in the United States of America. You get free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada, and you can get yourself a Casper mattress today. You can save an additional $50 towards a mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash knowhow. That's casper.com slash knowhow and entering the promo code knowhow. Once again, that's casper.com slash knowhow with the promo code knowhow. Terms and conditions apply. And we thank Casper for their support of knowhow. Okay, Brian. So before we went away, we were yeah. we were teasing this idea of being off the grid, right? Right. And there's there's more and more people who are not just preparing for the zombie apocalypse, but there's there's something kind of cool about being able to, to be self sufficient, about generating your own power, generating your own water, whatever it might be. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's part of the maker spirit, you know? Yeah. Like you want to be self-sufficient, you want to know how things work, and it looks like we have a question that we can answer for that. Yeah, so uh, what do we got? All right, so this one came from Jennifer, and she actually addressed our third member of the crew. Oh my gosh. Um, Jose. Jose, yeah. Brian, Padre, and Jose. <laughs> I live in the part of rural Minnesota that doesn't have the most reliable power grid. I try to be self-sufficient, so I've been getting into alternative energy sources that work for my land. I've got enough solar panels to power my laptop and basic appliances, but my diesel generator is needed more often than not. I'm wondering if KnowHow could do a series on making biodiesel for us Kitas who, who want to be off the grid. Jennifer, uh, thank you very much for tossing this to us. Actually, yeah. biodiesel is one of the topics that I've been wanting to tackle for the longest time. We just need a way to, to do it properly because I <laughs> yeah. don't currently have anything that runs diesel. I mean, you right. need a diesel vehicle or a diesel generator. Or creating biodiesel is a kind of a mess too. It could be a, it could be a little bit messy. Uh, and now we could talk about it or I could just bring you to New York. Cranky Hippo and I were at World Maker Fair and we actually stopped by the booth of a person who promised us that biodiesel is actually a lot easier than it used to be. You've heard of diesel. Maybe you've even heard of biodiesel. But did you know that you could make biodiesel in the comfort of your own workshop? I'm speaking with Ben, who's going to show us exactly what a home brew process looks like. Ben, what is biodiesel? It's a uh, fuel, fuel replacement for regular diesel. Uh, it's similar enough to the burn pattern of regular diesel that I can put it into any diesel equipment, trucks, tractors, and modified home heating oil systems without modifying the systems in, in question greatly. Now, all of the biodiesel processes that I've seen have, have been variations on a theme, and that is you find some sort of source of waste oil, typically from like a deep fryer, from a fast food restaurant, something that could give you an, an easy, consistent flow of, of usable material. But then you have to process it, and that process can get incredibly messy. Can you tell me what you have to do to go from fryer to fuel? I have to find, not only do I have to find the source of oil, but I also have to find a source for the methanol and the potassium hydroxide I need as my catalyst and my reactant. I use those to create, and from those I get a the, the solution for that. I end up with the glycerin, which is the byproduct from the biodiesel production and the biodiesel itself. The glycerin, need, you need to find something to do with the glycerin, which can be composted or recycled in various manners. The biodiesel then needs to be further cleaned in with uh, various wash methods to take out residual soaps, and they also have to have the particulate matters filtered out, so you end up with a sort of source of fuel that you can't won't clog your system with. 
reactant. Exactly what goes on with the catalyst and the reactant? What, what has to happen to the oil on the chemical level for it to actually be usable as fuel? What happens on the chemical level is the vegetable oil you receive is called a triglycerin. Yeah, it's a glycerin backbone with three long ester chains attached. The catalyst will break the bond between the glycerin backbone and those three long hydrocarbon chains, which will allow the methanol to take the place at the end, forming what are called methyl ester chains. That's what your biodiesel is. After that, you could drain the glycerin off. If your oil is old, though, from a used source, the source from a restaurant, the oil will start to degrade to free fatty acids, and you'll need additional catalysts to get the reaction to take place. Uh, you need additional catalysts because those free fatty acids will react with the potassium hydroxide to form soap ions. Those soap ions need to be removed later in the process, and the method I'm using is called a uh, water wash method. There are easier but more cost-consuming methods called dry wash methods that use ion exchange resins to do the same job. How much would it cost for someone to get up and running? Let's say they wanted to start making biodiesel in their workshop. Uh, they, they're willing to find themselves the equipment that they need. What's it going to cost them to get the hardware? And then what's it going to cost for them to continue making gallons of biodiesel? The hardware, if you if you are handy with a uh, welder, you can do a little metal fabrication. You can make a system like this for about $200. If you're not really comfortable with a welder, you can make a system using uh, an old water heater and some plumbing that doesn't require any welding. And for around the same amount or more, depending upon whether you have to buy a water heater or find one on the side of the road. The repeating cost, the, co the main repeating cost is the methanol and the potassium hydroxide, which will cost you about $1.50 uh, $1 per gallon of the finished fuel to make. Uh, varies with market price, but it always stays below the mar the market pump and the price of the pump for the diesel fuel. I guess the final question is, what do I do with it? So I know, I, can I just pour it into the tank for my diesel vehicle? Do I have to worry about any effects it might have on the engines and on the seals? Do I need to mix it with pure diesel to, to make it usable throughout the year? Uh, once I have my ga my gallons and gallons of biodiesel, what's the next step? The nice thing about biodiesel is you don't need to change anything with any, with any of the diesel vehicles. There's other methods that you have to modify the vehicles. This is zero mod to the vehicles. So long as it's newer than 1994, they'll have the, it'll have synthetic, synthetic rubber seals that are biodiesel compatible. Older than that, you might need to change the seals. There's kits, the hose is easily accessible. You look for very, there are very synthetic rubbers that will do the job. And thank you very much. If they wanted to find out more about your work, if they wanted to find out more about what you've done with home scale production, where should they go? Uh, my email address is ideal.biodiesel at gmail.com. There's also various uh, internet forums that I sometimes frequent. If you find out any more information, I'm on that. Uh, it's biodiesel. I think it might have changed. Biodiesel.infopop.cc was the common site for that. A lot of community discussion and development on biodiesel, uh, home scale biodiesel production. And thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Thank you for showing a very interesting system for creating your own fuel. And uh, if you're looking at commuting into the future, it's clean, it's green, and it smells like french fries. I've always wanted to play with biodiesel. I, I was actually thinking about a biodiesel conversion mm -hmm. uh, back when I was still studying theology in Berkeley, you know, back in the 90s. Uh, but, you know, back then... We had biodiesel back then? Well, we did, but I mean, it was really, really homebrew, and you yeah. did have to modify the engines, otherwise you would you would mess them right, up. Right, the hoses and things, the hoses like, rubber corrode, seals, yeah. Right. But as you said, if it's after about 94, so a newer vehicle, it's... Mm -hmm. it's perfectly fine. You can you can run biodiesel through it. It's not going to require any modifications. It's not going to require you to do anything special to treat the fuel. Right. I'm not going to and, and I live in California, so it's not like I have to worry about it getting too gummy, getting too cold. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I will say though, you know, I wanted to do this project, but unless you have a way to actually and reliably use the fuel, you end up with a lot of really flammable liquids sitting <laughs> in your lab. That's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, no, and I, I feel like you've are, you've run into that problem without having to create biodiesel. So why why would you want to add to that? But you can't convert your Corolla to. I could change the engine. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, swap could out everything. Do that. For um, the added benefit of smelling like French fries. For smelling like French fries. Mm. But, you know, like for Patrick Norton, his truck, he has a diesel truck that he right. runs in biodiesel. And that's that's cool. I'd love to do something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I, you know, if I'm going to be using up a large chunk of my lab space, 
Actually, I probably I would have to keep it outside. I wouldn't want to keep it inside the house. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You have to have space for it. Which it sounds like was Jennifer. From Jennifer, she yeah, she Minnesota, absolutely has space. Rural Minnesota. She probably has a lot of space out there. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> uh, what we probably can do is we'll do a small batch. We'll do a future episode where we'll actually show the chemical reactions. It's mm -hmm. actually it's quite fascinating to watch the chains break apart, and then you get that uh, that layer up top that you could turn into like soap. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, yeah. there's there's something that's awesome about turning waste a byproduct, absolute yeah. waste. I mm -hmm. mean, this this fryer oil, it gets tossed. It right. gets you know, a worst case scenario, someone pours it down a drain, which you're not supposed to do. Best case scenario, they send it to a recycler, and the recycler will take care of it. Mm -hmm. But it's waste. It's absolute. It's stuff we throw away, and I can turn that into energy. Now. It was a lot easier to do this back in the 90s because a lot of people hadn't caught on, so you had fast food restaurants who would actually pay someone to take away their waste oil. Right. Uh, and then you'd come by, you say, hey, I'll take it away for free, and they'd give <laughs> it to like, you. Sure. Now, they know what you want to do with it. So, so they might charge you for they it. Might. Hmm. Well, we'll see. But it's still, even going through the process, it'll be cheaper than going to the pump. And if you do have a d diesel vehicle, or like in this use case, a diesel generator that you want to use, um, it's not a bad, bad option, yeah. yeah. But okay, let's be clear about this. Yes, it will probably be cheaper than going to the pump. You could probably, even if you have to pay for the waste oil, it'll probably be close to maybe a dollar fifty, two dollars per gallon. Mm -hmm. uh, but you spend a lot of time and right. you're going to be spending time. a lot of money on the setup. <laughs> you're going to have to drive to yeah. get it and then drive back to your place and then yeah, spend the time making it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, and Jennifer, this is, this is to your point, you have the setup now and that means that even if the zombie apocalypse comes, you will have fuel. All you have to do is find some sort of oil, some sort right. of waste matter, even organic matter that you could bioreact and you've got yourself power. Right. Fuel. And then hoping that you can then later turn zombies into fuel because right. eventually it's all It's a cycle. The, you, yeah. make, you make that diesel powered zombie killing machine that turns zombies back yeah. into the fuel for the zombies. It's just a, yeah, thing. it's like a byproduct zombie cycle. It's well, what we're saying is it's perpetual energy. Basically. It is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the future. It's the future. It smells like the future. Mm. The future smells like zombies and french fries. French fries. Okay, let's get away from zombies and french fries. Next up, we've got a little something something. Brian, a while back, uh, you got a little toy from our friends from Fugu. I did, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, you're going to take a look at it. But first, these messages. We'll get back to all the know-how goodness in a second. But first, let me ask you if you recognize this scenario. It's the morning. You've been rushing around trying to get things done. Maybe you did a morning workout and now you're trying to gather all the gear that you need for the day. Well, you, you rush here, you rush there, and you can't find your keys. You can't find your phone. You can't find your wallet. Well, normally, this is a couple of moments of either panic or just mild annoyance. But what if I told you that there was a piece of technology that would allow you to get rid of that altogether? There is, and it's called the Tracker. A Tracker is a coin-sized device that helps you track all your devices at all time. We've all been there. We all know what it's like to lose something. But with Tracker, you never have to worry about losing your things again. This Tracker Bravo, again, this coin-sized device constructed with anodized aluminum, attaches to pretty much anything. Your wallet, your keys, your bike, your car. You just pair Tracker to your smartphone, and you can attach up to 10 of them. Attach it to any item and find its precise location with a tap of a button. It's that easy. Not only that, it also does reverse tracking. Let's say you lose your phone on which the app resides. Well, you can press the button on the Tracker, and uh, your phone will ring even if it's on silent. And family sharing lets you track the same Tracker Bravo from multiple phones. You can also customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you walk away from your item. Let's say, for example, your laptop bag at the coffee store. With over 4.5 million devices shipped, Tracker also has the largest crowd GPS network in the world. Why is this important? Well, once you go out of range of your Tracker, because it's connected via Bluetooth LE, you can still find a device's location as long as it's within range of another tracker user. It uses their device to send you a signal to let you know where it's, it is in the world. In other words, your keys could be lost in China. You could be in California, and you'd still know exactly where it is the last time it got pinged. The distance indicator on the tracker will show you if you're getting closer to your item, so it's almost like a little Dragon Ball radar for your gear. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, there's no reason not to give it a try. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to stop losing your stuff now. Go to thetracker.com and enter the promo code KNOWHOW to get a free Tracker Bravo with any order. That's the Tracker, T H E T R A C K R.com, promo code KNOWHOW for your free Tracker Bravo with any order. Tracker. 
keep track of all your stuff. And we thank Tracker for their support of Know How. Okay, Brian. Mm -hmm. I like fugu. The food, right? No. The, the poisonous no. fish that you have to prepare I correctly? have eaten it once, and I remember I had a numb tongue, and I was freaking out because I was like, oh, my God, I, they did it wrong. And like, no, no, you're supposed to get a numb tongue. I'm like, oh, wait. That's the appeal? That's what you want? Like, I, no, I could no. just go to the dentist for that. No, I'm not talking about the oh. blowfish. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the speaker. Now, that's right. Uh, it, is, it is my speaker of choice. Mm -hmm. I, it's the only wireless device I carry. It's nice. Right. It's small. It's compact. It's durable. I throw it in the ocean. I throw it in the sand. Yeah. But this last year at CES, they came out with a couple of new products. They gave some to you. They gave some to me. Right. Let's take a look at what you got. So this, is, I feel like you had spoken to them. This is the first speaker that they had given me to review. Um, and it's heavy duty. It's, yeah. You so did you, did you tell them something about me? Did you tell them about that Samsung active phone I, that I had? I, I, I told uh, them that you tend to kill tech. So they're like, okay, yeah. we should probably send him something that can survive him. Yeah, they were excited to send this to me. And I, I was excited to, to use it. And just at a quick glance, I mean, it, it looks heavy duty, right? It's got the metal top. It's got some pretty serious uh, screws and stuff on it. And then it came with these attachments that uh, there's even a handlebar attachment. But, you know, this is, it actually does look like the first generation Fugu speakers. It's bigger. It's definitely bigger. And I know it's got a lot more power than the original. The, that it was does. my biggest complaint about the, the originals. They had great battery life, they had great durability. They were a little soft. I mean, I would have liked it to be louder, but they needed to be bigger. That's what they did with this. And they, they've right. done away with the removable case because they realized that was one of the things that was adding up on the expense. Yeah, it was adding up on the expense. And, you know, honestly, for me, I wouldn't be changing. I'd probably put the case on and then never change it again. Right. So this kind of works out better for me. And it's just structurally, it's really strong like this. And the the attachments that go with it uh, make it more appealing. These, uh, yeah, because you did this with the belt clip and then you were walking around the office. Annoying that, my coworkers. That, that made, it was, yeah, they were really... That's exactly what it was made for. <laughs> okay. So would you say say that this is, th would this be the speaker for you? I mean, I already have my Fugu. This, uh, is, the, this is the working man oh. speaker. So you got your tool belt on one side and you got your Fugu speaker on the other. I'm just going to mark that down as a yes then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, before we go, I did want to show another bit of Fugu because Brian got one and I got one too. I got this. We uh, we did a first look at these a while back. This is the Fugu Go. The whole idea is to have a, a less expensive wireless speaker that had more punch than the original Fugu. That's exactly what this is. So if you, you take a look at this, uh, again, this is uh, it's a Bluetooth only. So this is, does not have any auxiliary input. That's one of the things I liked about the original. But what they've done to make up for it is they've made it incredibly affordable. So this is 100 bucks versus 200 or 200 plus. Mm -hmm. uh, for this, you're going to get far more power. Uh, you also get the controls that you would expect. Uh, you, you've got uh, forward, back, weird combinations. Like to, this is, you know, increase volume, decrease volume. Makes sense. But play pause, but then to make it go forward, you like press and hold or press and push. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Is, so it takes a little getting used to. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but uh, you know, again, just like the other Fugu products, really well engineered, very compact, Decent battery life. I've you know I've been I've been loving on these things. But here's the thing that I really really enjoy. This is actually a mono speaker. Uh, that might bug you, mm. but if it, if it bothers you, Duh. you can actually get two of these things. Here's the coolest uh -huh. thing about the Fugu Go. I really like this. You pair these with each other, and once they're paired with each other, mm -hmm. you can now play uh, stereo stereo sound. Is it, I'm so easily amused, uh, but it looks like a little face. Oh, it is kind I'm of like smiling a little face. At me. Like for example, here we go. Let's, so what I've got is I now have stereo sound. Oh, actually, no. I what I should probably do is turn them on. Yeah, but right. it's coming out of your wait. phone. That's right coming now. out of my phone. Hold on. It's like okay, there the phone's kind of loud. Hold on. Speaker is on. Oh snap. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> okay. It's kind of loud. Yeah, enough of that. Loud. No, they are really, really loud. And the cool thing about this is because they are wireless, I can actually mm -hmm. separate them. I can give myself separation. So it's not coming from a single unit. I right. can actually have them on opposite sides of the room. 
And I like the the nifty. It's like this little elastic yeah. band thing that Carrying, they have, and then you thing. can wrap it around a pole. I, I at first it. I thought this was gimmicky, but that comes in really really handy. I've used that more often than I can I can mention. Especially if you want to hang no, it from your belt. No, what is with you and hanging speakers off your belt? That's not what you. it's for. No, or you could like no fashion police neck. say no, Brian. <laughs> yeah, fashion they've been telling me no for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I the. The uh, awesome part about this is mm -hmm. it's affordable. So we're talking about $100. Uh, the, the thing that I really like is that, that separation, the fact that I can mm -hmm. have two speakers and, and kind of space them out wherever I need them. Yeah. Uh, I say the only cons would be the fact that if you're looking for affordable, this would be it unless you buy two, and then it's the cost of one of the larger units. Right, but you get that separation. You get that That's separation, cool. and you do get really loud speakers. You get a lot of sound out of these things. Really good sound, by the way. Nice and heavy on the bass. The mids are are, are, are decent, and the highs are nice and clear. Mm -hmm. uh, battery life is not as good as the original Fugu, but again, I'm putting out a lot more sound with these, which explains why I don't get as much battery life. Right. And I do kind of miss the AUX board. I know that's going away. People mm -hmm. don't need the 3.5 millimeter jack anymore, but I, I'd like that because it, it's always my fallback. That it always is, works. Even yeah. if the wireless is freaking out, like if, I, if I'm using this at CES and it's got that really bad wireless environment, right. I can always count on the AUX jack. This right. doesn't have one. Or easily switch between music devices. Like sometimes when I go to a friend's house or something, yeah. it's like, oh, just just plug in your phone. Don't worry about connecting the Bluetooth. And but these ones also, they don't have um, a microphone on these, right? You can't yeah. use it as like a precisely a like gun. the the Fu original Fugu and actually even yours. Mine does. Yeah. It's got uh, four microphones, so you can use it as a speakerphone. Put it in the middle of a conference right. table. This does not do that. The other thing about this is. Uh, pairing them to each other is a tiny bit convoluted. Mm -hmm. uh, my first go, because I didn't read the instruction manual, because I'm why would you? I'm a man. Okay, well, we don't okay, that. there's that, but then there is. It's like it's a Bluetooth speaker. You shouldn't right. have like a very complicated process to and, it. And you can pair both of these to your phone or your laptop at the same time. Yeah. But then sound only comes out through one or the other. Hmm. The way that you actually do it, and I'm going to do this as a little tip for anyone who's out there. You have to put it into Bluetooth. Let me turn up the the sound so you can actually hear it talking to us. You you put them into Bluetooth pairing mode. Speaker is like on. this. Hold on, one, two. Three. Disconnected. Pairing mode. Use the Bluetooth settings on your device to connect. Oh, yeah, the second one too. Let's do this. So uh, the first speaker. Disconnected. Pairing mode. Use the Bluetooth settings on your device to connect. Okay, so what I do is I hold down Bluetooth and the plus button. Pair up mode. Okay, now it's on pair up mode, and then I do it the same thing on the second one. <laughs> Pair up mode. <laughs> I love the like movie studio voice that they use. There we go. The speaker is on. So nice. Pairing successful double. And then I can switch back and forth between stereo and mono. And I only need to Bluetooth connect to one of them. And the other and one will yeah. transfer it over. And that's, that's actually good because that's how it handles the sync. If I did have two Bluetooth devices mm -hmm. trying to both receive sound from the same device, they would desync. Yeah, and actually there are some older Bluetooth speakers. I think I reviewed them for Before You Buy It. They are the UE uh, Mini yeah. Booms, yep. and you could do dual speakers with them, but you had to download their app yeah. so that it would then send the signal from your phone to both speakers and have it be synced. This seems like a, a better idea. This is a better idea. It's a little weird if you're not used to it, but after you do it one time, then mm -hmm. it's it's fine. Uh, once you do get it synced up, though, I mean, they... I have never had to resync them. I've never had to repair them. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if, if you're looking for a smaller alternative, something a little less expensive, something that you can expand later on, something with a lot of sound, I'd give the Fugu Go a go. Awesome. Yeah. Well, folks, this has been a lot of information. Uh, hopefully that uh, you've, you've been learned because we were trying to learn you. Knowledge, Knowledge in your head in <laughs> from your us. Head. But if you couldn't keep track of everything, we do have a place where you could find out where you can buy these, uh, the other th questions that we have, the biodiesel yeah, stuff. Safe from. <laughs> if you want to be able to find that stuff, you're going to find it at our show notes, which lives at twit.tv slash kh. And not just the uh, links to things that, that we talked about, but also um, if you've ever missed an episode and you don't want to, you could subscribe. Or if we have like a multi-part episode, which we've done in the past, you're going to want to download some of those. Yeah. And also, don't forget that subscribing to the RSS feed is the best way to support the show. If you want to see more know-hows, if you want to spread the word, that's where you tell people to go because you can get know-how delivered into your device of choice twice a week, because remember, we do the show on every Thursday and Monday, mm -hmm. and it, uh, you know, it helps us because it lets us say, hey, look, there's people out there who want to learn, 
help us to learn them. That's right, right. And if you want to learn more and you want to ask us questions, you can always find our Google Plus page where our over 11,000 kitas live, uh, kind of the hive mind of answering questions. But if you haven't, go there, check it out, ask a question, um, or post a project. Yeah. Or like in today's episode, that's how we get our questions um, for these feedbacks. If you don't post, you can't get on the show. Mm -hmm. Also, don't forget you can find us on Twitter. That's a great place to find out not what, just what we're doing on Know How, but what we do when we're not here in the studio. Like, for example, when Brian's out trying to kill people on a motorcycle. That's, that's well, that's, yeah, that's an everyday thing. Or you want to see uh, how the our, our plants are growing because I added a chia pet and it kind of got... Grew a lot, it and it did. Got, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's now more like the chi hairy pet, chi chir. It didn't grow even. No, I thought it, it was going to. I, but, I think yeah. you did something wrong. I think I it probably just didn't did. Like it. But if you want to, yeah, if you want to see where where we've gone wrong, or ask us a question directly, you're going to want to follow us on Twitter. I'm at cranky underscore hippo, and you're going to find me at padre sj. And we've got the third member of our crew. What was his name again? Jose. Billy. Billy? Jose. Jose. Oh, sorry, Jose. <laughs> you can find Jose at twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3. He lives in the void. <laughs> 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 From which he will never return. Never return. Excuse anymore. me, Padre. It's pronounced Alex. Oh, uh, see, see, the A-L always throws me pronunciations, off. man. I just can't get them anytime. <laughs> Until next time, I am Father Robert Ballasare. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. I'm trying to think, like, whoa. <laughs> go listen to speakers. Go biodiesel. Um,